Hello friends. Welcome to Fifth Avenue's Sunday School Hour. I'm Gwen Craddock and we're in our second session today of Creation and Fall. Where did you find God last week? Where was he most obvious to you as you went through your week? I would love to know your comments. I think we grow so um, in our relationships and towards God when we look for him and we share him with one another. I found him in my windowsill this week. We have a prickly little cactus that sits there. It's got needles all over it. It's not the prettiest thing in the world. It's growing towards the sunlight. And as I looked at it, I don't know, I was just um, challenged that I wanted to touch it. I went to touch it and I withdrew my hand because the prickly part of it, the needles, would stick. And as I did that, this thought came to mind. Do you, do you remember? And ashamedly, I thought, yes, I do remember. I had been in the presence of one with a prickly disposition, obviously. And rather than to wait for that someone to help me in line, I decided to go to another line where there was a friendlier person, a more friendly person, whichever. I looked at that little cactus and I thought, certainly if I touch it, it's not going to hurt me that badly. And I reached out and the needles did they were sharp and I could feel them, but it didn't hurt me that bad to touch them. And I was reminded of Colossians 3.12 that says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now when I see prickly personalities, I offer a smile. I remind myself that I have to represent God because I'm made in his image. Remember, that's what we talked about last week, being made in God's image. And we saw he created and formed Adam in such a marvelous way. And then we talked about the beautiful garden where Adam was given to live and Adam was given a chore there. He was to work that garden. And that was the purpose of Adam was to work the garden to build a relationship with God. They were in that together. And as we go through life, we need to be reminded that we're in this together with God. And uh, he doesn't give us anything to do that is outside of his parameters and his boundaries. He can do all things through us if we just have faith in him. So before we begin this morning with chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, would you pray with me? Father, we come to you with expectant hearts because we know you have a plan and we want to be a part of that plan. So Father, as we listen and watch for you to touch our hearts in this lesson, please give us peace. Please give us courage to step out in faith, doing that that you call us to do. Help us to be faithful stewards of your word and of your love. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we look at chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, we're going to see that God found a couple deficiencies in his creation, but he's going to fix it. So let's read these verses together before we um, delve into them, okay? And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a, help, a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. 
and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And when they were both naked, the man and his wife were not ashamed. Praise be to God. As we look at that first verse, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that Adam should be alone. I will make him a helper who's comparable. That has caused some controversy in the past. And it has caused me some question as well, because sometimes I read in the New Testament and I get a little confused. So I looked up helper in the Hebrew, which is where this word came from. And helper means to be a counterpart, um, to go alongside of, to be actively involved with another. So that helped me to understand my role as a wife, as a female, to be a helper. It helped me to know that I was equal rather than being inferior. And I didn't have to be dominated, but I was an equal part to share in life with those around me. I wasn't quite sure whether I wanted to believe that whether it really was biblical that I believe that. So I did some more research and I went to other parts of the Bible and to other concordances and I found an explanation that fits really well for me that woman is equal to man and there is equality and that's what Jesus calls us to be is equal and helpmates for one another. So if you will look with me in the book of John chapter 5, Jesus was totally under the authority of God the Father. Let's look at John chapter 5, verse 19. That says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. There's a bond there between God and the Father. And we see it in this scripture. There's another one, John 8, 28. Let's see what that one says. Oops, went too far. John 8, 28. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me. Now this is when Jesus was predicting His departure. And remember, Jesus went to the cross at the bed of God. God sent His only Son there, remember. And Jesus went there. Uh, willingly, I know he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, but he also cried out in agony before he got there. And that's for another lesson. And we'll soon be to it because Lent is not too far away. Back on task, I do have trouble sometimes trailing off, don't I? Not only was Jesus under the total authority of God, Jesus is equal to God. So let's look at that. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, I can say that when I'm not talking to you on video, but I know that I probably didn't say that exactly the way it is. So let's look. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I did get it right. Um, 8.58, John 8.58 says... Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. So remember, I am was God with Abraham 
and with Moses. So God and Jesus are equal. Jesus is talking in John 158, 558, 8.58. 10.30. Let's look at John 10.30. Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Does this give any kind of indication to you that man and woman are equal, serving the same God with the same purpose, in the same way, in the same manner? I, maybe you've never questioned that. I have heard the superiority thing. I have heard that women are not always worthy of being equal unless they bear children. I have heard that women are subordinate because they were taken from man and man came first. And I've heard women were subordinate because of Eve's sin. But I don't see any of that in the Bible. So hopefully if you've heard those things and they've been a concern for you, what we've read this morning helps us to know that we're all equal in God and he created us equal because if we go back to Genesis 1 28 what does that say please forgive me for Bible hopping but um, it's all given here 128 it's no longer in my Bible 128 says then God said let us make man in our own image according to our likeness let him have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over the cattle of all so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them, he blessed them, and told them to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing. So Adam and Eve worked together. And one is not over the other. They both subdue, are to subdue the creation that God has made. And, and it's all biblical, it's all good, it's all here, and um, the relationships are supposed to be um, that we live in community and we enjoy one another's company. So let's look now at the next deficiency that God saw when in the next few verses out of the ground, he formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam and told him to name them. I don't know whether you have a mind like mine or not, but that had to be a lot of animals. And I don't read here that Adam got tired. And I think Adam must have been pretty intelligent. But you know what bothers me that I don't see Adam said anything to the animals. I don't know whether he's talking at this point or not. Do you have questions like that? And I don't have answers. My mind just wanders and goes goes off. Um, whatever, Adam had to be extremely intelligent. It seems to me he was a biologist as well as a botanist. As he took care of all the plants and took care of all the animals and he named every animal and he gave them a description. And then Adam after looking at all these animals, I wonder if God gave Adam animals in pairs or if God gave Adam one animal at a time. I don't think it says that either. And I don't know why I'd wonder other than if he gave Adam animals in pairs, why then Adam may be thinking too that he doesn't have a suitable partner. But then it doesn't say that Adam said that. God did. God saw that Adam had a need and God was going to fulfill it. So what did he do? God was the first anesthesiologist. He caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. Now I wondered too why that was, but then I thought, well, Adam would probably have whined and said, why have you got to do this to me? Why didn't you make her like you made me? Oh, that hurts. 
When will you be done? She's gonna be like me. I don't know. But I think God was wise to put Adam to sleep, don't you? And he took one of his ribs. And as I read this week to study, it may have been one of his ribs. It may have just been flesh from his side. Um, that's undecided too. But he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place and brought him to Adam. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And he named her. But notice he didn't name her Eve. He didn't name, give her a name. He called her woman. And Hebrew for male is ish, and Hebrew for female is isha. And so that was just a derivative of the root word that Adam did for woman. And he called her woman until, I think, verse 20 in chapter 3 when they sinned. But we'll get there, okay, so we won't run ahead. Um Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Very interesting here, and this is called, we always hear these at, these verses at weddings, don't we? But Air Sunday School Quarterly opened my eyes to the importance of community here because, you know, not all of us marry, and that's okay that not everyone's married. We're still God's children and he loves us all the same. Some of us are not married by choice. Some of us are not married because of circumstances. And again, it's all good. We're God's children and he loves us all the same. But what we need to understand here is that God put us here to form relationships to form a community, to be a part of one another's life. And we all have emotional needs. And these partners, these kindred spirits that we find, understand us emotionally and spiritually and physically. Adam and Eve were unashamed simply because they were pure, they had not sinned, and they knew the love of God. There's a transparency in a relationship. Now, if you don't have a marriage partner and you have a good friend, we can relate these verses to that as well. You have someone who understands you physically, uh, is not critical of what you look like, nor critical of your size, nor critical of your clothing, or what you wear, or how you talk. That's a friend indeed. A kindred spirit understands you emotionally. A kindred spirit or a partner is one that you can share your heart with and you know that they may not understand, but they're gonna love you anyway. They're not going to, for the sake of curiosity, ask lots of questions and then drop you like a hot potato and not have anything else left to do with you. They're gonna always be there to listen they're gonna always be there to love. They're gonna always be there to nurture. And then from a spiritual standpoint, they're going to always be there. They're gonna be there to listen to your questions about God. They're gonna be there to listen to the times that you've been confused by scripture. They're going to be there to listen the times when you've been hurt by a fellow church member. They're going to be there to listen to your highs, your mountaintop experiences, and your valley experiences. They're just going to always be there. 
and there's not going to be, they're going to be naked in front of you. You're going to be naked in front of them, sharing your heart and knowing there's love that binds you together. So as we look at this lesson, there's another question for you and me. Not only who is my kindred spirit, but who am I a kindred spirit for? Who can I be that sounding board for to bring them closer to God, to bring them closer to knowing who he is and what he provides for us? Jesus empowered us through the Holy Spirit, and he does not see gender, age, and social status. Salvation comes to all people and challenges come to each one of us that are in ministry. Where will you find that perfect kindred spirit that you can share your love of God with your shortcomings and listen to theirs as well. In what practical ways can you partner with others to care for the community around you? As the curtain falls on chapter two of Genesis, we end on a really high note Please come back next week for chapter three when we look at the first eight verses and see God's sustaining love as we go through those verses. Will you pray with me? Father, what a blessing to study your word, to feel your presence, to review the creation story and confirm in our minds that you love us all equally, that we all have purpose, that we are all called to be your stewards, to live in a relationship with you and with others. Father, help us through the coming week to have eyes wide open to those that need to hear your message, to feel your love, and catch a glimpse of your kindness. Give us the courage to move out in your name, to share you with others. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen.